Good day, fellow investors. We continue with our summary chapter by chapter for the book Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman. Link to the other chapter, chapter one that we did is in the description below. If you enjoy this, smash that like button. Let's start. Chapter two discusses how Wall Street actually works against you. So Wall Street is all about getting clients in, but they don't work actually for the client. They work for the fees. And when you understand that, you can avoid to fall into Wall Street's trap. So we did speculators and unsuccessful investors. Now we do the nature of Wall Street works against investors. Because the problem is that what is good for Wall Street is not necessarily good for investors and vice versa. Versa. So that's the key argument in chapter two. If you understand that you will avoid many, many issues down the road and Wall Street is always there stronger and stronger trying to get your money. The key is that we have to deal with Wall Street. But the problem is that what's good for Wall Street might not be good for us. And the secret is that we learn how to deal with Wall Street so that we take advantage of Wall Street and not the other way around because Wall Street has three principal activities trading investment banking and merchant banking and as traders Wall Street earn commissions if you look at the wall for Wall Street it's just about commission so uh, they earn that by bringing buyers and sellers together so more buyers more sellers more commissions and as investment bankers they arrange for the purchase and sale of entire companies by others underwrite new securities, provide financial advice, and opine on the fairness of specific transactions. Wall Street firms perform important functions for our economy, raise capital, so everything great, provide liquidity, connect buyers and sellers, but you have to understand that Wall Street is paid not for how good they do something, but they are paid for what they do. That's it. For example, brokers are highly motivated to sell high commission securities. For example, this is a broker that I actually have an affiliate link in the description of this video. It is an international broker offering access to many, many markets. And therefore I say, okay, it's a good broker. If I get a fee, if you click on the link, that's good for me. And it's hard to find better. There are a few brokers, but this is one that I've picked for global reach. For those that are interested in that, you can check it. But first is what they focus. They want to put your trader on your mobile phone. Who can make professional trades on mobile phones? Yes, of course, nobody. So that's because they earn fees when you do things fastly on the mobile phone. They want to get you into margin because they earn interest when you are on margin. Most commission made by trading crypto. So they offer everything and therefore they are a good broker. But you must not fall into the trap of getting into that noise, getting into that machine of trading constantly because the only one that will win are the brokers then. That's very important. So use the broker for the quality services that fit you but don't allow the broker to use you. That's extremely important. And that's exactly what Seth Klarman explains in the Wall Street theory. We must use brokers, but don't fall into their trap. Then we also have investment banking, securities underwriting. If you follow Tesla over the last 10 years, Goldman just upgraded Tesla and then underwriting the stock so that they make another 10, 20% on the underwrite. And they get 2 to 8% when they underwrite something, when they issue new shares. Fees lead to incentivized frequent trading, mergers and acquisitions, even if it doesn't pay. Just look at Warner Bros. that we are watching now. Huge fees paid for the merger for everything with the AT&T and everything discovery. So that's how Wall Street works. They will always find the bullish bias that we'll discuss also in a second. And as I said, they make 2 to 8% of the proceeds raised. If you just look at this capital raise from Tesla, look at all the banks involved. So they find the customers for the stock, but they also get nice fees. And then also Klarman discusses how when you're buying IPOs, 
you have very motivated sellers, the owners, the management, you have very motivated investment bankers that sell you whatever. And yes, just an example, Wall Street was behind all the huge amounts of Chinese IPOs that came into the market since 2014, 6.4 billion in fees made on those, whether investors made money on those, that's not relevant. And then also Wall Street will always create vehicles just to sell something. And that's the beauty of this book. This was written in 1991. But if you just change the securities, the vehicles, everything is the same. Nothing changed with the technology. Nothing changed on Wall Street. Back there it was junk bonds, leverage buyouts. Now we have specs. And that was booming over the last years with high liquidity. Specs just exploded because the money had to go somewhere and a lot of people took advantage of that, got nice and shiny fees at the cost of customers that invested with them because it was so cool to invest in specs that's 70% down in a year. But Wall Street certainly made a lot of fees and they will find something else. And this is a quote from the book. So closed end mutual funds are typically offered initially to investors at 10 per share. So nothing changed there. It was just specs at 10% and 8% commission. So uh, quick loss there. But again, explaining the periodic boom in closed end mutual funds issuance, the periodic boom in specs now, something else later, it's a barometer of market sentiment. As I said, this book is an evergreen no matter when it because it explains the core of how things work and explains how Wall Streeters are focused on the fee on the commission and on the February bonus. Some people work on Wall Street solely to earn high commissions high incomes expecting to depart a few years. Compensation figures are so large. This was in 1991. Now they're even larger. Can ensure a person's financial security for life just for a few years. And again, great example recently, Credit Suisse backed Archigos Capital Management that was over levered over everything. And now, of course, they are getting cutbacks, but they will rebound and then they will again back such things because of the fees they make. Something more important to understand, many Wall Streeters, especially stockbrokers, have come to believe that their clients will normally leave them after a couple of years. So that's the nature of the business. Uh, I'm having a down year and many are leaving, going somewhere else. But that is not an excuse, as Seth Klarman says. This does not excuse those who assume their client turnover is the norm and thus seek to maximize commissions and fees over the short term. Because then client turnover is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Very, very interesting, straight to the point, and a great point to think about whether what is offered is for your money to get a commission or it's really there to offer you value. Always ask yourself, be it me, be it anyone else, how is it working? What's the incentive? And I think we have discussed that pretty much over the last week. Next, Wall Street, YouTube, bye bye, 10x here, 10x here, 100x, uh, look for that 100 beggars and hold forever. That's how you get clients in. Because if that didn't work, let's find something new. Let's invest in India. Let's look for the next 100 beggar because that sounds so perfectly but that's the best way to sell is to be extremely bullish. You go on the greed or extremely bearish or, or bearish. That's how you end after it in you bank on the fear. Good markets. Everybody makes money. Just check revenue from uh, Robin Hood 2021. Everything was booming 50% lower revenue on commissions. So that's how it works. And they are incentivized to make you trade even options on Robinhood, whatever they did. Strongly biased towards buy recommendation. Everything is a buy on Wall Street. If you look at the recommendations for the S&P 500, 56% of the stocks are a buy. That's more than half of the market and that's impossible. 
38% are a hold, so positive for 94% and just six negative. Pause here and try to think about how many stocks actually beat the market. So how many should be a buy actually and how many should actually be a sell. Pause here and just think about the real percentages. Wall Street is giving you 94%. Pause. Okay, did you pause? Okay, let's go. 36% of stocks are buy or hold because just 36% of stocks do beat the market. 64% is actually a sell because it underperforms the market according to statistics. So keep that in mind when you get buy recommendations. Oh, something else. With these buy recommendations, Wall Street never ever analysts in models assume a recession. We always discuss that. So there will never be a recession anymore. And then there is a recession and everything crashes and everything goes down and all these models get trashed. They make new models and they continue. So that's also a bullish bias. And sell recommendations are unlikely to be issued because if you say negative things, you just get hammered. I did many negative videos, just negative feedback on that. And uh, it's very hard someone lost his job for writing a negative research report about the atlantic city hotel casinos owned by donald trump a prospective client of jenny so still always the same nothing news there financial innovations everything is getting great in uh, tech in everything but those are usually great for wall street and not great for investors we have discussed etfs and everyone sees them as the holy grail of investing but when you think about who benefits the most it's always wall street who benefits the most from financial market innovations. If I just look at the number of ETFs worldwide, we are now probably even higher than this. This is insane. So uh, really insane. And who benefits here is all those that get a fee because if not, there would just be a Vanguard ETF and that's it with minimal fees, but that simply explodes to get fees, to get everything, cryptocurrencies, innovation. There was one Bitcoin and now we have 10,000 of them. So that's insane. And who benefits is of course, Wall Street. And then Seth Klarman comes again with his eternal wisdom. In virtually all financial innovations and investment fads, Wall Street creates additional supply until it equals and exceeds market demand. When a particular sector is in vogue, success is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The downward movement, however, can also become self-fulfilling. So that's Seth Klarman. And then he also discusses how it's not easy to distinguish between a real long-term structural trend and the Fed, but it's better to avoid those Feds or trends because you don't want to be trapped in a Fed. He then explains the mortgage securities, how they invented interest only, principal only, and all the crazy things that they did in the 1980s. There it was a regulator, but regulated a little bit, but still we had the 2009 financial crisis. So it wasn't regulated at all. And Wall Street just keeps doing what they were doing and they are doing it again and they will do it again. That's a given. We have now another innovation, modern monetary theory, an economic theory that suggests that the government could simply create more money without consequence as it is the issuer of the currencies. Nobody wrong. We can just print money forever. That innovation worked for 10 years. Now we have 12% inflation in the Netherlands, for example. Also, what's the inflation? The real inflation, how much they say and what prices actually went up. Let me know in the comments. So another innovation that yeah, worked and not. The problem is with innovations and everything, the main issue is that you have to think about a change in assumptions. Analysts, as we said, don't ever mention a recession, a volatility. They mention it when it's too late. So that's also something to think about. Klarman continues discussing feds. So in the 1980s, energy, technology, biotechnology, gambling, warehouse shopping, even defense, etc. Those are all feds and we had marijuana stocks in 2019. I was the only idiot that didn't want to invest in that in 2018, sorry. And uh, well, I am and always will be an idiot like that. And then we had uh, 3D printing just a while earlier. Now we have lithium and 
Wall Street will create the supply 10 lithium ETFs. This is insane. And uh, now it's still going higher and higher. We'll see whether it will be a Fed or not, but security prices eventually become too high, supply catches up with the excess demand, the top is reached and the downward slide ensues. It's not easy to distinguish between a Fed and a real business trend, but you have to simply try to understand the risks and perhaps you might even avoid and still make money without even catching that hot business trend. The conclusion, Wall Street can be a dangerous place for investors. You have no choice but to do business there, but you must always be on your guard. The standard behavior of Wall Streeters is to pursue maximization of self-interest. The orientation is usually short term. This must be acknowledged, accepted and dealt with. So you don't lose money when you deal with Wall Street. I hope you enjoyed this chapter. Don't forget to smash that like button. Next Friday, we'll put chapter number three, the institutional performance derby.